The movie begins in the year 1983 in a suburban town in America. A father, David Rayner, is yelling at his eight-year-old son Jake to wake up because he is late for school. When Jake doesn't answer, David goes to check on him and comes across a troubling sight. Jake has stopped moving and is secreting fizz from his mouth. Without wasting time, David rushes him to the hospital and discovers that his son is not the only person who woke up like that. The hallway is full of parents carrying their children and trying to contact a doctor. In fact, according to the news on TV, every single child in the world under the age of nine has fallen into a catatonic state. Reports from the Asian, Australian, and African countries are flooding in asking for expert advice but even the smartest scientists have no idea what is going on. Chaos ensues as parents come to the streets to protest but even they do not know what they are protesting against. Days turn into weeks, months, and years but the children never go back to normal. Every child born after 1983 is born in the same condition, threatening the end of mankind. Several laws are formed to protect the rights of sick children and to stop people from procreating further. This causes economic and social instability around the globe which further gives rise to many problems. The only movement the children make is when they get intense seizures twice a day at the same time every day. Science has no answers to what the seizures mean just like how it has no answers to the entire plague. Cut to 10 years later. Eight-year-old Jake has now turned into an 18-year-old boy but with no life inside of him. He is fed and kept in a healthy condition but David and other parents of the world have given up on getting their children back. In David's town, the school is closed after the last batch graduates and the gym hall is renovated into a hospital for the sick children whose families have no means to take care of them. The head doctor at the gym is a woman named Jean. Then, we are introduced to Jean's ex-husband Tom. He went to jail a few years ago for killing a man in a bar fight. The incident changed his life and took his job and family away. After serving prison time, he has just recently been let out on parole. Since Tom has no place to live, David allows him to stay at his house for a few days where Tom also gets to meet Jake. David has brought several medical equipment for Jake's comfort. Tom comments they must have cost a lot but David rationalizes that nothing will amount to his son's happiness. He seems to believe that although his son cannot express his feelings, he can still tell what is going on around him. In the evening, Tom meets Jean who isn't happy to see him. They share a brief conversation before she asks him to stay away from her. Tom is still in love with her but she only sees him as a murderer. The following day, Tom goes to the police station to meet his old mentor and the town's sheriff. There, he sees two teenagers who have been arrested for trespassing. Ten years ago, they narrowly crossed the age of nine and were saved from being like the other kids. While most such children are in bigger cities making a lot of money, these two break into houses and talk to unconscious children. No one knows why they do it but by the looks of it, they seem to be struggling mentally. In the next scene, we see a doctor walking into the gym for a regular checkup. She is met with horror when she sees that they have come back to consciousness and are staring at her. The woman cannot believe her eyes and freezes in shock until one girl attacks her. Back in the house, Tom wakes up because of a noise and sees the state of emergency message on TV. He rushes upstairs to check up on Jake but finds him missing. Then. He goes to David's room to discover that his face has been squashed to death. Seconds later, Jake appears behind and attacks him. He is about to be killed when his childhood friend and Jean's brother Sam arrives at the house. He hits the kid with a tire iron and throws him off the window. Sam also reveals that the entire city has been swarmed by the awake children whose only aim is to kill the adults. No one knows what they actually want but people are dying at a frightening rate. Suddenly, they remember that Jean was working a night shift which means she is surrounded by sick children. They quickly make their way outside but are yet again approached by Jake. At first, he tries to attack them but stops and falls unconscious. After that, Tom and Sam drive to the school. The first dead body they find is of a nurse with a deformed face. While trying to climb the stairs, they are attacked by the kids who try to grab their faces for some reason. They are saved by the same two teens who Tom saw at the police station earlier. 
They introduce themselves as Kip and Claire. It turns out that the killers think the couple is one of them, which is how they have survived till now. Tom asks them to quickly get out of the city while he and Sam continue looking for Jean. When in the hallways, they are almost spotted by a horde of the killers but they manage to hide inside a room with locked doors. They also find a group of eight survivors waiting for help. The doctors think the police are on their way to help them, unaware that no one in the town is safe, including the police. Tom is told that Jean went up a vent to get medicines for an injured survivor. He follows her behind, asking Sam to take care of the others. A few minutes later, Sam hears someone trying to break the door. He panics and asks the group to go down the laundry chute. They make a rope out of bedsheets and manage to climb down one after another. Sam goes last but halfway through, he hears the others screaming in pain. Realizing that they have been attacked, he climbs back up and unties the bedsheets. Just then, he sees a nurse trying to climb up the chute but because of his mistake, she falls to her doom. Everything goes quiet for a second before Sam sees a guy inside the room. Meanwhile, Tom is crawling through the vent when he comes across another kid. He is about to be attacked but Jean arrives at the right time to save him. They both come out of the vents, deciding to return to the others. However, upon reaching the room, they see Sam with a bloodied weapon and no survivors. Jean is heartbroken because they were her colleagues. Tom calms her down before the three of them make their way outside. In the hallways, they are joined by Kip and Claire. A little further, they meet the sheriff who is also looking for survivors. All of a sudden, a panicking guard attacks Claire, assuming that she is one of the children. Before he calms down, the actual children drag him away while the others run to the door. Outside, the sheriff's wife Nora and the deputy are waiting for the survivors. When they are distracted, the children land and attack. Somehow, the others arrive at the right time and manage to free them. Amidst the chaos, Claire is left behind with the children while the others drive away. Kip is worried for her but is hopeful that the children won't know she is a human. The group stops in the church where Jean takes care of Sam's injured leg. He yells in pain for several minutes before she finally gives him drugs to make him sleep. While everyone stays in a safe room, Tom goes around the church to check if there are any more children. While inspecting the chapel, he is attacked by a girl. The sheriff runs to see what's up and is shocked because the girl is his daughter. His wife Nora weakens at the sight of her girl in such a condition. Instead of killing her, they decide to tie her hands to the railings. Somewhere else, Kip finds a pastor's journal where he has written interesting things about his dreams. A few hours later, they see the pastor outside being swarmed by the children. They hold him to the ground while a kid touches his face and kills him. Before dying, the pastor says that he is not yet ready, disclosing that he knows something the others don't. Kip then shows the journal to Tom and asks him to read the last entry. In it, the pastor has predicted his death, saying that his soul was taken by children through his face. He has also written a line that roughly translates to, the children give what they receive. They are not able to depict what it means but Tom keeps the page just in case they need it in the future. Meanwhile, Nora sees her daughter tearing up and believes that she has turned into her normal self. She quickly unties her hands, only to be attacked and killed brutally. When the sheriff arrives at the scene, his heart drops. Before his daughter can do more harm, he shoots her dead and commits the unthinkable. In the morning, we see that Claire is still alive. She goes to her house and finds her mother's dead body in the bathtub with her face crushed. In the meantime, the group finds out about an army base near their town which is their only hope for survival. They pack up all the necessary stuff and go outside but come across a broken car. It turns out that the children are getting smarter by the hour and have learned to disable the engine in cars. They have done the same to every car in the neighborhood so Tom has to think of another way to escape. He then remembers that David had a car inside his garage which could still be working. Since Sam cannot walk, he and the deputy stay at the church while the other three go out to David's house. They reach the place safely but come across a girl in the front yard. She even has a gun on her and seems to know how to use it. Suddenly, Claire appears and kills the girl. 
She also discloses that the children are learning to do new stuff and almost all of them have a gun by now. Back in the church, a horde of children attack Sam and the deputy. A while later, the rest of the group arrives to their dead bodies. Jean kneels down near her brother and breaks into silent sobs. She gets up surprisingly quickly, driven by the will to kill all the children. On their drive to the town's border, everyone notices her stiff demeanor. When they are distracted, two guys start firing at the car. The tires go flat causing them to come to a halt right in the line of fire. Tom asks everyone to stay down but Jean doesn't listen. She comes out of the car and ambushes both enemies. She continues fighting even after they are dead while the others watch in concern. Now that they are out of bullets, Jean wants to return to the town's police station and get some from their storage. Tom argues otherwise because there is no need for guns in the army base. Still, Jean remains adamant and makes her way to the police station on her own. Kip and Claire join her shortly after, leaving Tom the odd one out. He walks towards the army base for some time before sitting down to read the pastor's note again. He rationalizes that the children are sucking out people's souls but the way to stop them isn't clear on the note. Meanwhile, in the police station, they find two children gathering up all the weapons. Since they won't suspect Claire, she decides to go inside to steal the guns. The other two patiently wait in another room until they hear a gunshot. Kip runs to Claire and sees that she has been shot. He kills a man but is in turn shot as well. The two sit beside each other until they ultimately die. Some time passes when Tom arrives and finds a frantic Jean in the hallways. She has lost all senses and is paranoid that the children have surrounded her. Tom gently brings her back to her senses before they go outside. Since they do not have a vehicle, they are soon surrounded by the children from all sides. Tom makes Jean kneel down and remember the moment she was the happiest in her life. While she does so, he walks to a kid in the crowd and tells him that he is ready. Tom has finally figured out that the kids give you back the emotions you show to them. When you give them fear and anger, they do the same to you. Seconds later, Jean opens her eyes and finds herself alone. In the last scene, we see her reading the pastor's note while enjoying a beautiful day outside her house. Then, she sees the children surrounding her house yet again. This time, she simply goes inside, leaving the door open as a sign of trust.